Hello and welcome to Sound Biblical Doctrine. This is study number five and this is about rebellion in the church. The previous four studies we've looked at, number one was Jezebel in the church, number two was Sodom in the church, number three was confusion in the church, number four was adultery in the church. And yeah, these are all bad things to have in the church, but we have to understand how they got in in the first place because if the men, and this is what this study is going to be about, if the men that are the overseers of the church, if they had done their job properly, would not be in this situation. If they had enforced what the scriptures say and they held to them, we wouldn't be in this mess. So, yes, previously we looked at problems within the church, but now we have to look at why these problems are in the church and on whose watch it happened. And yes, it is true that there are things in the scriptures which foretell this is going to happen. But that does not excuse the men for their part in this. You know, it was written in the scriptures that Judas was going to betray Jesus. But he still got punished for it. Yeah. Judas still had to pay a price for that. And he's still paying that price. So, let's not get into some situation, some semantic situation. Say, oh, the word of God says this is going to happen. There's nothing the men could have done. Well, it's not as if they died trying, resisting. It's not as if they're still resisting. So many of them have just been bulldozed by this wave of nonsense that started in the 60s. And they've just gone more and more lukewarm and more and more limp, more and more weak. And the bottom is they don't fear God. Because if they feared God, they would hold to his standards and not allow anything to come in that doesn't meet his standards. Because God has got standards for men in a position in the church and an authority role. It's not like any guy can just rock up and be like, I'm a pastor. It doesn't work like that. Because unfortunately, in the modern day church, there are a diverse range of quote unquote qualifications that men believe entitles them to occupy an authority role within the church. Some of these include graduating from a college or university with a degree in theological studies, Another one will be attending, but not even graduating a seminary or divinity school, or being a member of a church for a long time, being friends with a current pastor or other senior figures, having a lot of zeal, tithing a lot of money, assuming that being a novice doesn't matter, or simply attending a church that has so few people that there's basically no one else to do the job. So they have to pick someone from the congregation, whether they are fit for the job or not. So... This is what you're dealing with. However, none of these are biblical prerequisites. None of them. None of these on that I've just listed, none of these things that I've just listed will qualify you in God's eyes to be an overseer of his church. Yes, God's grace is amazing, but he also tells us how it is. And if you want to be in a position of authority within a church, how are you going to enforce God's way, how are you going to enforce God's word if you've not applied it to yourself? And this is the problem. This is why it's so weak and lukewarm. Because the men are rebellious. They have not followed what the scriptures say. They have not endured to get to a point where they, when God has blessed them, that they do meet his requirements and then they are fit. They've sought to shortcut this. They've sought a fast track to get in there and do it this way. And it's just, it's rebellion. That's all it is. That is it. If the biblical parameters are not met, all of the above need to be seen for what they are. Rebellion, individually and collectively. Individually by the person making the choice and collectively by the men of the church that are encouraging them and allowing them to have the confidence that, yes, you, you don't have to do what the Bible says to be a pastor. There are other ways. You know, it's nonsense. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through them all. And we're going to start with the theological slash seminary background. So a theological degree or seminary education is only relevant if, one, the institute correctly teaches what is written in the Bible, and two, the graduate actually learns to follow what is written in the Bible. Otherwise, a degree is little more than a worthless piece of paper, and for the graduate, his time spent attending such an institute may be just four plus years of his life that he can write off. But unfortunately, what he has learned and the debt he has accrued along the way will not be cast away so easily. Yes, it is written 
We know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose in Romans 8.28. But it is also written in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 5 to 17. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labour. For we are labourers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive award. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Know you not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So when the fire comes to try your works, don't be surprised if your degree gets burnt up, and you have to go through the building process again. Only this time, let the word of God be what educates you, not men interpreting the Bible for you. And you will be able to look back upon your time at college and university, as an example of how to learn the hard way, i.e. how not to do it. Number two, being a long time church member. Yes, being senior in the faith is an attribute that is required, but sitting on a church pew every Sunday for years doesn't make you a senior in the faith, especially if you're attending a lukewarm church that abandoned the teachings on the Bible a long time ago. You are likely just an old baby in chains, old in the flesh, still a baby in the faith and doctrinally in bondage, having your mind and heart polluted with heresies and your conscience seared with a hot iron, as we read about in Hebrews 5 verses 12 to 14. For when the time you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them who are of a full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That was Hebrews 5 verses 12 to 14. We have 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So if you're just sitting in a church on a regular basis and you've been there for years and you've got to the point where your your conscience is seared with a hot iron because you've been, been embracing false doctrines, doctrines of devils and you're speaking like a hypocrite, that is not a qualification that entitles you to be a pastor or an overseer. Next we have number three, if you are friends with a pastor or an elder. Yes, we should be approved by those that are already within leadership. But if those that are within leadership are not teaching what is in the Bible, how can you be friends with them? And why would you seek them for anything? Speaking the truth is what is required of a godly man, not being nice. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. That is Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. Then we have Proverbs 8, verse 7. For my mouth shall speak truth, and wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Then we have Zechariah 8, 16. These are the things ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbour. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. Then we have Ephesians 4, verse 25. Wherefore put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbour for we are members one of another. And then we have 1 Timothy 2, 
verses 1 to 7. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all, good, in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Wherefore, I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. So speaking the truth is more important than being friends with a pastor and elder. And if your pastor or elder friend doesn't speak the truth, you shouldn't be seeking to become a member of his church. And that is so often what is the case, is men think to get closer to God, they have to go up the ladder. They think they have to become higher up in the church, they have to become a pastor and they're going to fix it that way. And you're not going to fix it that way. It's written if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you're in a church that is embracing false doctrine, going up the ladder isn't going to fix it. Because you're seeking approval of people that are teaching false doctrine. And unless you're going to try some kind of takeover from within, I mean, how are you going to do that? They're teaching false doctrine, their congregation accepts false doctrine, but you're going to go in and you're going to try it like some kind of business takeover and you're going to go in and then you're going to become the pastor and you're going to kick everybody out. Well, who's going to be left standing? It's going to be much easier for them, and especially, you're, it's written we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a spiritual battle that you're going into. And if that spirit is within a church, you have to overcome that spirit. You can't just get in a position of authority and that's it done. You know, what if, what if these people don't want to follow the word of God and God's separating these people to expose them? You know, you, you can't really fix it that way. I get that people's intent is good, but the, the scriptures say we're meant to mark them which teach false doctrine and avoid them. It doesn't say try and usurp their position of authority within the church and then you'll fix it. You have to follow the word of God and then see where that takes you. So like I said, speaking the truth is what we should be aiming for. We want to be friends with the truth and not friends with a pastor or an elder to become an authority within the church. Number four, zeal only. Yes, having a lot of zeal is good, but there has to be a lot more to a man than just zeal in order for him to occupy any of these positions. And we read about this in Romans 10, verses 1 to 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So if a man is ignorant and does not know the way of God, how can he teach others? His zeal will not automatically mean that he follows the word of God. He must have submitted himself unto the will and to the word of God. And his zeal should keep him going during that time. Not during that time, he's always meant to be submitted to the word and will of God. But you can't just have a lot of zeal and just think, oh, that's it. We read about this in Luke 6 verse 39. And he spake a parable unto them, Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? So just because you've got a lot of zeal, you need some direction. You need some guidance. You need to be obedient to the word of God. And just being all pumped up and ready to go, you're just going to lead people with you into a ditch because you don't know which way you're going. God is going to try you. I mean, Jesus Christ was 30 when he began his ministry. Yes, he was a carpenter, but there was obviously a whole ton of, um, not like tests, but trials that he had to go through. You know, he was tempted of Satan when, just before he began his ministry. But prior to that, you know, he's, Jesus is perfect. He's our example. But every temptation there was, he overcame. He didn't just like fly in and be like, yeah, I'm, I'm Jesus, I don't need to prove anything. This is how it works. He was still tested. He was still tried. And that's who we follow. So keep the zeal. 
but submit yourselves unto righteousness. Submit yourselves unto the word of God. Number five, people trying to buy their way into the job. Yes, tithing and giving is a biblical principle in both the Old and the New Testament. And we read about this in Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honour the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruit of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. And then we have Malachi 3, verses 6 to 11. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And then we have in Luke 6, verse 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give you into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. And then 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 8. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So tithing and giving is for the Lord's purpose and should not be seen as a way of buying your favour with the church hierarchy so you can get into a position of authority as Simon tried. Yeah, Simon tried and that sin is called simony. And we read about this in Acts 8 verses 14 to 24. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw, through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of the things which ye have spoken come upon me. So it's not in any way biblical to try and buy your way in. And if you're trying to buy your way in, that tells you what you're dealing with. If you're in a position and someone wants to try and buy their way into the church, you know exactly what you're dealing with. Moving on, number six, an untried novice. Being a novice and untested is also a danger because such a one will lack roots and therefore if his hand is prospering and does a good work, he will be lifted up with pride. And when he falls, this will give the devil and the people of the world occasion to condemn him publicly. And we read about this in 1 Timothy 3, verse 6. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. It should be noted that being a novice is not the same as being young. It's written in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So if someone is born again at a young age and continues to grow in the faith, then there will come a point when they are still relatively young in the flesh, yet they will be well established in the faith. This is not condemned and is therefore not grounds to exclude a man, provided he meets the other requirements, which will be discussed later. 
Number seven, a pastor asks or pressures a church member into accepting a position if it becomes vacant. Especially in small churches, they don't want to have vacant authority positions and rather than trusting in the Lord that he will add to them as they need, the pastor slash elders ask people from the congregation who are not qualified. And this includes women these days. And if the offer is accepted, both parties claim that it was a working of God, perfect timing, etc. We read in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So we as Christians are commanded to be patient, and if our stance on what the word of God says has made us low in numbers, then this is part of the testing of our faith, and we must not make hypocrites of ourselves. We must continue in the faith, trust in God, and let all things be done in decency and in order. Romans 5 verses 1 to 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Continuing on, we have Romans 8, verses 24 and 25. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Then we have 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. So remember, the word of God dictates when you should be elevated, not your circumstances. And if you're, like I said, if you're in a church with not many people and none of them qualify for a position, an overseer position, then that means you're not meant to elevate any member of your church until they do so. We have to be patient. And if this is something that's in our heart to do, we have to be patient and follow the word of God. And when God blesses us and we we start to fulfill these qualifications, then we are fit but not any other time. So before we go on to examine the biblical qualifications that a man must have in order to be fit for a hierarchy within a church, let me clarify my circumstances. So I just just in case you think I'm this guy that's just railing on people, I'm not, I'm not a pastor, I'm not an elder, I'm not a deacon, I'm not a bishop, I'm not married, and I do not have children. And therefore, I am not qualified for any of these offices. I'm not ruling any of them out in the future, but at this moment in time, I don't meet the entry requirements for any of these positions, and so I know God is not calling me into any of these roles, and until God decrees otherwise and my circumstances change, these positions will continue to not be an option for me. However, this does not mean that I can't do anything for the Lord. The following is not an exhaustive list of the members of the body of Christ, but examples of roles that do not require a man to be married with a family for him to be fit for the calling. These include apostle, prophet, teacher, worker of miracles, one bestowed with the gifts of healing, helper, one that speaks in tongues, evangelist, watchman, messenger, preacher. And we read about the different roles in the body of Christ. We begin with 1 Corinthians 12 verses 27 to 31. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but cover earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Then we have Ephesians 4.11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Then we have Isaiah 21 verse 6. For thus saith the Lord unto me, Go, set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. Then we have Proverbs 25 verse 13. As the cold of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that send him, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. Then we have Romans 10, verses 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear 
without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So there are plenty of other options available for myself and others in this same position. However, there are far too many men within the church who feel that they can ignore these prerequisites and jump on the fast track to becoming a pastor. And then when they get the title they desire, they all of a sudden think they are biblically qualified to be an overseer of believers. They assume that everyone's mind operates like their own and therefore think that people will only notice their title and not consider how they got there. This breeds hypocrisy and is rampant within the church and unsurprisingly it bears no good fruit. And it was also something that Jesus warned his disciples about regarding the Pharisees and Sadducees who were the religious rulers at the time. We read about this in Luke 12 verse 1. And in the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. These men treat the church like the rat race, and they just want to get to the top as soon as possible. So we should not look to them for an example, but rather we should think upon the real men of God spoken of in the Bible and ponder on how they began and how they rose up. Consider how David became king. God elevated him, not ambition. Read in James 4.10 Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. And then we have 1 Peter 5.6 Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. That does not mean that God's grace is unable to redeem someone who went into leadership when they were not called and have since built a family, ministry, etc. upon this. However, it is going to require a lot of humility and they're going to have to learn to teach and follow what is actually in the Bible, especially regarding doctrine. And further, it means that if a man were to come to them for advice regarding getting to the ministry as a pastor, deacon, elder, etc., then they would have to admit that they are not fit for giving personal advice on the subject. Yes, once they're in, they might know how to give you advice because God's grace is amazing and although they weren't qualified to get there, once they're there, God can still use these people. But in terms of getting there, if they have just gone in one of these methods that was outlined above, they're not fit to teach you how to get there because they did not follow the biblical parameters. They just went another route. And then when they got there, God's grace was upon them, that he could use them to help other people. But their path is not exemplary, is what I'm saying. So as long as a man is able to admit that and say, you know what, I didn't, I'm a living example of God's grace, like we all are, okay? Like we all are, because apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, we all deserve to be in hell. But once we have that as our foundation, once we are saved, Yes, we can definitely choose to obey or disobey God. And if you have disobeyed God and you've somehow still ended up in a position of a pastorship, then you have to admit that it's by God's grace that you're there. And not because you have followed a path where you were tried by God according to his word to get into that position. Not that it's going to give anybody pride, okay? Because as we looked at here, you have to humble yourself for God to exalt you. So nobody's going to say like, oh I did it, I'm proud I did it the right way. Because if you are humbled, that's how God raises you up. It doesn't leave room for pride. So I'm not saying I'm perfect. And like I mentioned earlier, if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would be in hell. But when it comes to this topic, I know I'm not speaking as a hypocrite. Yeah, I know I'm not a hypocrite because I'm not putting myself in a position where I'm saying, oh yeah, this is me, but you're wrong because of this. I'm saying that position is not available to me because I fear God and God's word says this is what you need to do to have that position and I don't have that. Yeah, so I'm not a hypocrite when it comes to this issue. And if you want to judge that, then read Matthew 7 verse 5. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye and then shall thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. So that's what I'm saying is that if somebody's going around with a beam in their own eye and trying to, I don't know, find fault, then you say, oh, well, deal with yourself first. But God has humbled me, shown me that apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, I deserve to be in hell. But 
now that I am saved, I fear his word. And I'm not going to put myself in a position to be one of these overseers because I don't qualify. So if somebody has not, doesn't fear God, doesn't care what his word says and has gone in that position, I'm not a hypocrite when I'm calling them out is what I'm saying. Because although there are a lot of other problems in the modern day church, the buck stops with these men. It is due to their failings that the mainstream church is in the state it is in and that it has been backsliding for a long time. These men have been slothful, unthorough, prideful and vain. They lack nobility, diligence and discipline, but most of all they lack godliness. It is the men's duty to learn the doctrines of the Bible, to hold fast onto them, to walk in faith with them and to teach them to the younger men so that they can continue the work that Jesus Christ commissioned the church to do. For centuries there have been many godly men who have faithfully carried out the work that the Lord has laid before them and much of what we have today is built upon the work of these men. Consider the apostles, the early church fathers, the faithful martyrs and latterly the men who compiled the King James Bible, Noah Webster's Dictionary and Strong's Concordance. These men and the men that worked with them carried out a great undertaking to help us have a better understanding of the Word of God. And there are a wealth of other good works men of God have done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both on the earth and in the church, for the benefit of men at the time and for future generations. Consider all the church buildings that have been established for the sole purpose of serving and worshipping God. Yet today, how many of them contain the truth? This generation of men has abandoned their roles within the church and they have sought out worldly pleasures and temporal riches. They have dropped the ball and sold out the future generations. And for what? What do they have to show for it? They may have money or fame or a finite amount of power or maybe even all of these things. But you only have to look at the story state of their congregation to know that they have no treasure waiting on them in heaven if they get there. And then we read about this in Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The time is coming when God is going to shake all that can be shaken, and we are going to find out who is who. We read about this in Hebrews 12, verses 25 to 28. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear. And then we have Luke 18, verses 16 to 18. No man, when he lighteth a candle, cover it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed therefore how you hear, for whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that which he seemeth to have. So we're going to find out who is for real, and who is in it for the show, and who is in it for the money. Yet, yeah. as we move closer to the Lord's return, God is going to start making things black and white. And if you're not founded upon the word of God, and God starts to shake things, then you're going to be exposed. This is exactly what happened in Jesus' time. The people that were most opposed to him were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They hated the Lord because he exposed them to the masses. And they couldn't, they didn't want to come out. They didn't want to show their what was in their heart in front of the masses because then they truly would have been exposed. Jesus knew, he told his disciples, even the Pharisees and the Sadducees were aware that Jesus knew they weren't for real. That they weren't interested in serving God. They were there for their own reasons. And we read about this in Matthew 23 verses 1 to 36. Then speak Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, 
but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their flasceries and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold, and whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift, whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon, and whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint, and anais, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the others undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautifully outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Because you build the tombs of the prophets, and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye then up the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues, and persecute them from city to city, that upon ye may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So this scripture is in reference to the Jewish leaders of the time, but it is still, as ever, an accurate description of the hypocritical leadership which is within so many of today's churches. And continuing on, we have John 10, verses 7 to 14. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and have known of mine. So on that note, let us look to the word of God, and see what the conditions are for a man to occupy the position of bishop, deacon, elder, or pastor. 
So we'll begin at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and we'll look at verses 1 to 13. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Then we have Titus 1 verses 5 to 9. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless, as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. Then we have First Peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 5. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. So we can see from these scriptures that the minimum fleshly requirement a man has to have in order to be a bishop, deacon or elder is a wife and children. And then on top of that, there is a list of other requirements that have to be met. So just having a wife and children doesn't automatically qualify you to be a pastor. Yet in a nutshell, you have to prove that you can bring up your own family in the way of the Lord before God will let you take care of his family. And we read about this in Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that I may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So, someone might dispute the above scripture, saying it does not state that an elder has to be married, However, the following clearly shows that an elder is in an authority position. We read Acts 14 verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And then we have 1 Timothy 5 verses 17 to 20. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labourer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others may also fear. And we read earlier in First Peter chapter 5 that Peter was an elder, and we see below that he was married. We read this in Matthew 8, verses 14 and 15. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. And then again in Luke 8, verses 38 and 39. 
And he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. So an elder is an overseer position. We've read the conditions for being an overseer. We know that Peter was a, an elder and he was married. So we can assume that in order to be an elder, you have to be married and with children and you have brought your children up in the way of the Lord. Otherwise, we need to find elders that are not married. We have to find examples of elders that were not married in order for you to justify your position. If you are not married with children and you're not a man, I mean, listen, even get, women have no role in church, so we've gone over that, but you do get women that are trying to assert themselves as elders. But what I'm saying is, to be an elder, the scriptures show us that you have to have a family. You have to be married to one wife and you have children. You have to bring them up in the way of the Lord. And that's just what the scriptures say. And we see that this was the case with Peter as our, our example. So now we're going to move on to pastors. And although the role pastor is mentioned in the scriptures, it is not directly clarified what the conditions are for a man to be a pastor. Read about pastors in Jeremiah 17, verse 16. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee, neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. However, when we look to what the definitions of pastor and bishop are, it becomes clear that they are the same position. So let us begin by looking at pastor, that is a, a shepherd, one that has the care of flocks and herds, a minister of the gospel who has the charge of a church and congregation, whose duty is to watch over the people of his charge and instruct them in the sacred doctrines of the Christian religion. And then we have a bishop, an overseer, a spiritual superintendent, ruler or director applied to Christ. You were a sheep going astray, but are now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. In the primitive church, a spiritual overseer, an elder or presbyter, one who had the pastoral care of a church. The same persons are in this chapter called elders or presbyters and overseers or bishops. So there's much more to the definition of bishop, but we can see here that it's a bishop and a pastor are the same thing. Um, and so the, therefore the requirements to occupy these members are also the same. We see that this is confirmed when we read what role God has advocated for pastors. So we read Jeremiah 3 verses 14 and 15. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. However, and very aptly for this study, the following scripture shows what happens to a congregation and lands when the pastor neglects to follow the word of God. Allah, the modern day church. Let's look at Jeremiah 10, verse 21. For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. And then we have Jeremiah 12, verses 7 to 13. I have forsaken mine house. I have left mine heritage. I have given the dearly beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. Mine heritage is unto me as a lion in the forest. It crieth out against me, therefore have I hated it. Mine heritage is unto me as a speckled bird. The birds round about are against her. Come ye assemble, all the beasts of the field come to devour. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard, and they have trodden down my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate, and being desolate it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate because no man layeth it to heart. The spoilers are come upon all high places through the wilderness, for the sword of the Lord shall devour from one end of the land even to the other end of the land. No flesh shall have peace. They have sown wheat, but they shall reap thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but shall not profit, and they shall be ashamed of your revenues because of the fierce anger of the Lord. So we can see here that it's not a good thing that happens when these pastors do not follow the word of God. They don't prosper, the congregation is scattered, and the land is desolate. However, and this is the important part, the Lord will ensure that these men are punished accordingly. And we read about this in Jeremiah 23 verses 1 to 4. 
Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. And this shows us here that once God has punished these men, in their place he will set up men that are fit for the calling. And we can praise the Lord Jesus Christ for that.